depending on rounding, uh, rounding and, and uh, whether you calculated the interest factor or looked it up. But uh, yeah, it's roughly around there. So by this uh, comparison, the, the, we would go with uh, option one, right? If we were just looking at cost, uh, cost alone. Let's see, it's more efficient. Yeah, and actually the uh, option two is more energy efficient, right? Had the higher COP. So in this case, uh, the, the, the extra savings on energy doesn't quite compensate for the higher, higher cost, right? Think about another five years. Another five years? Yeah, it, I mean, you can do, especially if you set this up in a, in a spreadsheet, um, you can do lots of you know, what ifs, and you can like, you know, what what interest rate would, you know, shift the, uh, well, that might not be, uh, but you could, you could look at the effect of the interest rate, or you could figure out how long it would take, how many years it would take for the more efficient one to pay off. Um, actually, I, I was thinking after uh, our, our presentation last time um, from Hamid, you know, he talked about Excel. You know, I think somebody asked about what software he uses and to type, to use Excel. I started to think, we need to do more Excel uh, applications in our program because, uh, yeah, Excel, I use Excel all the time. And my wife, who's an engineer, and, and others I, I know, we focus all the time on MATLAB and things like that. But, you know, which is great for brute force engineering calculation, but in a lot of the more broader kinds of analysis that we do, or we might incorporate engineering analysis into other things, uh, cost in particular, Excel is really helpful. It's also uh, really helpful for uh, load analysis when you're doing uh, heat transfer analysis on the building. And um, I have spreadsheets. I, I use spreadsheets for uh, fluid mechanics to figure out um, the friction loss. In a, you know, if you have uh, parallel networks of pipes, or if you have like a, a set of tanks and the tanks are interconnected, some are at a higher elevation than others, trying to figure out, well, if I open this valve and this valve, how, how is the water gonna flow? How is it gonna equilibrate? That can be really, really hard to do by hand and actually involve trial and error, but with Excel, you set that up in a spreadsheet and you can do it pretty, uh, pretty easily. Um, maybe, maybe next time I'll have more uh, I've got little programs for um, duct analysis and for uh, choosing a chiller. I, I have a, 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 an Excel program for um, selecting chillers and sizing chillers. Um, um, I've got one for um, pipe flow analysis. I've got one for do, uh, doing economics, but I haven't yet figured out how to really incorporate those into my teaching. That's going to be next. Um, yeah, so anybody get to the second one? Do the second problem? Yes. <laughs> no, I didn't write. For, uh, the winter, uh, the, the, the energy analysis? Let's see, where's my... Uh, where's that?
Anybody get a result for energy consumption? Now you're looking at this and you think, wow, um, why would anybody have electric heat? This is um, electric resistance heating. Like baseboard heating would be a common uh, for, for a residence. Kind of, we have the little uh, heater outlets up along the, the floor uh, at the wall, and they're just, uh, it's just electrical resistance. And uh, the conversion efficiency is close to 100% in that kind of a system because you're converting electric energy to thermal energy. And that is, uh, entropy likes that. <laughs> you're going from low entropy to high entropy. Uh, so you can do that close to 100%. Um, going the other way from thermal to electric, of course, that's a different story. Now, we could have had another uh, option here. I don't think I was in the um, If I did this just to, as a, as to run a comparison here. If we use the heat pump, um, if we had a heat pump with a, uh, a COP of 2.5, basically two and a half times more efficient than the electric baseboard heat. Um, we're still paying for electricity to run the heat pump, but uh, if, you, if you do the cost analysis at the same electricity cost, it's uh, 1,112 uh, per year. So now you look at the three, uh, gas 14, Electricity 2780, heat pump 1112. Now the heat pump is the cheaper option. And this is uh, uh, what's driving the push now. So we had the readings for today on uh, decarbonization. That's the buzzword if you go out in the HVAC now. Everybody's talking about decarbonization, decarbonization, decarbonizing buildings. And um, we actually did a conference on this uh, last fall uh, with our local, uh, Ash was a joint meeting of uh, our, our local ASHRAE and the Washington Society of Professional Engineers, but um, they had three experts on building uh, energy systems talking about what it'll take to decarbonize buildings in the U.S. And what, that, what they're trying to say is uh, you know, moving our heating away from natural gas. That's the, that's the biggest part of it. Moving away, most, most buildings in the U.S. are heated with natural gas. Most residences, but I guess if you include commercial, Probably it would be commercial as well, but especially residences. Um, heat pumps are starting to, to gain in market share and penetration, but still it's mostly the south where the climate is, is winters are moderate. Um, the problem with heat pumps and, and why we would have to be suspicious of this simple analysis here. We, we want to do this in an Excel spreadsheet and do a lot more extensive uh, uh, you know, here we're doing a balance. This analysis assumes a balance point of temperature of 55 degrees. Um, 
but the balance point changes. It differs by location, it differs by, uh, by time of the year, and all these factors vary as, uh, you know, the heating load varies through the year, so it's not constant. But what happens with heat pumps is the COP drops dramatically as the temperature goes down. It gets, it's very high when it's warm out, so it's 40, 45, or 50 degrees. That's when the heat pump is really effective. COP maybe 4, 4.5 in that range. And as the temperature drops, especially below 30 degrees outside, we're talking the air source heat pump. As the temperature drops below 30 degrees, the COP really starts to drop. By the time you get to 10 degrees or in the teens, um, the heat pump is not much different than the electric baseboard. You're really losing. Although now, you know, the Japanese have come out with heat pumps that claim to be efficient all the way down to like minus 20 Fahrenheit, minus 15, minus 20. So we are seeing better air source heat pumps. Um, but for, uh, for cold climates, um, a water source heat pump would be a better bet. This water, uh, or a ground source heat pump, the ground stays at a constant temperature, even though the air is gonna be up and down. The ground is generally around 50 degrees, um, 40, 45, 50 degrees year round, 45 to 55 in most, most places. And uh, that's gonna give you a more consistent performance, a more consistent cost. Um, now one of the groups, you guys are looking at the heat pump at 21 acres, and they're using it for uh, water heating, and, uh, and they're trying to get water, what, 140? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I thought about that over the weekend, and I was looking up uh, through some of my technical material, and um, that strikes me now as, you know, as we are talking about Friday, it's a very, very difficult application. Um, R410, which is the refrigerant used in most heat pumps uh, today, really only works well up to about 140 degrees. That's the refrigerant temperature. Um, 400 to 450 PSI on the pressure. That's at the condenser, and that's a really high pressure. To get the water, to heat water up to 160 degrees, you would have to have R410 near its critical point. You have to have 600 PSI in the condenser. That's a really high pressure. I, I don't know how they're doing that. Um, I thought about it. I don't know how they do it. There must be something I'm missing. I haven't worked with heat pump, with water source heat pumps. Um, I, I probably should need to uh, spend some time studying those and, and, and bringing that into my teaching because uh, we're, we're starting to see a shift toward more heat pumps, but they're still not widely used to the point where engineers have a lot of experience uh, working with. Water, water source heat pumps. They're just starting to, they're starting to grow. And, uh, so I, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear. <coughs> I would not advise a client, based on what I did over the weekend, to heat water up to 140. I think 120. Now, the systems that I'm familiar with for water source heat pumps, and these are becoming more popular, but the ones I'm familiar with are air-based, air source heat pumps. And what you, what you do in this situation, now household, you, you don't get to heat water to 130, 130 degrees is your hot water temperature. And what you typically do with the heat pump is um, use your evaporator. You've got your compressor here. And your condenser. So if you're gonna do a um, a hot water heater, and you can do this for, for a heat pump that's providing heating and air conditioning. It's, it's a really nice way to knock out uh, a bunch of different things with one mechanical system. Um, when you come off the, uh, when you come out of the compressor, the, um, the you know, very hot vapor, superheat vapor, very high pressure, you know, 130, 120 to 140 PSI, probably.
No, I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be a lot higher than that. 400. 120. PSI. Yeah, it's going to be very hot. Uh, I would like to look at the peak at the. Look at our diagram here. Or our 410. So let's see. Typically, we're going to come off the compressor with R410. We're going to come off at about 180 degrees. 180 degrees, 400 psi. Yeah, that's going to be about 115. No, wait a second. 100, 180 degrees. 180 degrees and 400. PSI, something like that. Um, but when you get into the condenser, you're going to be saturated. Saturated liquid, 400 PSI. And for that, you're going to, you're going to be at I don't know, 115 degrees. So you've got a spread of 180 to 150 degrees. And what you can do is take this and run it off to a hot water heater. So this is your uh, 180 degree refrigerant. And that's going to go to your water heater. And it's going to desuperheat. The, uh, the hot water heater, you let the refrigerant drop off its superheat and cool it from 180 down to saturation at 115, and then it goes in and it condenses. That's how you can take a, a, an air source uh, heat pump for a, a residence and use it for heating, air conditioning, as well as water heating. That, that's a pretty common way to set these up. But I don't know if uh, 21 acres has something like this, or if they're, they're pulling off. That might be something to look at. Are they taking the refrigerant and doing something with it? Um, probably not. But. So they're, what 21 acres does, they're trying to get 180 degree, not 140 degree hot water, but 140 degree hot water, and they need, sub, they need gas to supplement with gas. And they're trying to get away from that. But anyway, um, so heat pumps are the direction that we were, were moving in. And ASHRAE has been reluctant to define decarbonization as electrification. What, what a lot of, especially more environmentally conscious HVAC engineers are saying, stop talking about decarbonization, we're talking about electrification. That electrification with respect to buildings means heat pumps, replacing uh, uh, gas, and uh, even, even conventional chilled water systems with modern heat pumps. And Ashley is saying, wait a second, we want to be neutral with respect to technology. Let uh, engineers and clients decide what the best type of solution is. And um, yeah, so anyway, after I spent a good part of last summer studying heat pumps as, a, as an option for residential heating, and I looked at all kinds of heat pumps. Not water source, because I don't have a, a source of water, and I can't bury pipes in the ground, so it has to be an air-to-air -air heat pump. And I did not like what I saw. Uh, based on my own analysis for my own needs, and I did some pretty extensive costing and, and uh, technical, and I did not like what I saw. And so I'm not yet ready. I, I think it is a solution. Um, I think it's a potential solution, but it's expensive. <laughs> it's a very expensive option. Yes? And for like, I mean, at least in this area, like Washington, yeah. isn't it? Um, don't you need a furnace by like law as a backup? Because it gets too yes, cold. Yes, yes, the cook. Uh, 
Yes, in, uh, in my neck of the woods, you, you do. And, and so if you have a, a, a contractor put in a heat pump, they will put in a backup gas uh, unit or electric. The recommendation is to go all electric. And, yeah, that would be a great thing to do if you have solar panels on your home. And um, then you can generate your own electricity. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't have that myself. And, uh, but anyway, the whole premise behind electrification is that the electricity will be generated in a green manner um, through renewable energy. So if you're just replacing you know, natural gas that's local with natural gas or another fuel that's uh, in a central power plant, you're, you're not gaining a whole lot. Uh, you're gaining some because it's just more efficient to produce energy centrally and then distribute it than it is to you know, generate on site usually. But um, this whole shift toward electrification really goes hand in hand. Electrification of buildings goes hand in hand with energy transition on the electricity side. So this is where kind of HVAC meets up with electric power generation because there are two problems that have to be solved at the same time. If we're going to green our buildings' energy systems, we have to be greening the electric power systems at the same time. And uh, this is this is going to be a big engineering challenge for the next few decades. Yes. Uh, maybe I'm just dated on the uh, heat pump capabilities of like heating, mm -hmm. but for like heating a home, you know, they kind of sh typically struggle heating wise. Yes, yeah. And then so like if you're at this system where you're also heating the water, you need like how how substantially larger of a unit would you need to do to do that? Um, I I don't know. I would have to sit down and do the the analysis. I, for my own system, I wasn't uh, looking to do hot water because I, I have a reasonably new hot water heating system. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it's um, more money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he's going to be these are uh, yeah. These are just expensive. And costs costs are coming down. But I think in our area, gas is going to be a more att attractive economically as of last summer. <laughs> okay, as of last summer, because what's happened, as you probably know, is the price of natural gas has practically doubled since the end of last year. It has doubled in price. So all bets are off. I mean, gas now is uh, back up to where it was before fracking. Bought the prices down. So you lock yourself into gas, you're taking a big risk because gas prices historically, natural gas prices, are all over the place. Unlike oil, oil, the price of oil is set globally and it, it, it's the same all over the country. Now, gasoline prices will vary. That's because of refining. Gas is expensive in the Northwest because of we have a very bizarre setup for refining and bringing. Even though we have refineries here, you think it would be gasoline would be cheaper? You know, we've got Anacortes, that's a big refinery up there, but we actually have some of the highest gasoline prices in the country. Um, but typically, oil itself as a feedstock is constant, but natural gas varies wildly uh, by season of the year and also by where you are around the country, how close you are to a pipeline. Actually, here in the Northwest, we're pretty good. We have gas from Canada. Um, comes by pipeline, you have good access to gas, natural gas. So it, it's been pretty inexpensive compared with other parts of the country. But man, man, it's like, I've been to the grocery store lately. <laughs> it's like inflation. I, it's, I feel like I've been transported back to my senior, junior year, senior year of college, I think was the last time we saw inflation. Um, it's coming down. It was right after beginning of Reagan's presidency and inflation was coming down and interest rates were all through the roof. And it's, yeah. I would ask for problem two, is that yeah. something we'd be we would need to know for the exam? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I have some uh, practice problems that we'll do we'll be here in just a second. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, let me, in fact, I, I never really got, I never really went over the slides that went with this, uh, going over the energy analysis here. Let me, uh, I think there was an example. 
from yeah, there was the a, last time, I think. It was handed out. Yeah, because I had these presentations. You know, I had the economics was written out in notes, and then the energy stuff was on slides. Um, sustainability aside because we have we do have an exam on Wednesday and I want to spend some time uh, preparing and doing some practice for that. Yeah. Quick question. Yes. Do we need a physical ductilator? You should have one, but you you can do these problems without a ductilator. They're just more time consuming. You have to use those uh, those graphs in the book. The graphs of um, Velocity versus diameter. Um, yes? I have a follow up question. If the one person at our table has a calculator during the event, how do we have to share? Yeah, you can share. I, I don't have a problem with that. If you want to pass around a ductilator, do not talk, though, or pass around answers. But, um, or, or you just, I trust you, you all, you guys, so I, I'm, I'm okay with that if you want to share. Huh? I said minus ten dollars. If anyone wants it, there you go. Trying to review for dollars. Ten dollars here. Yeah, Shelby knows his economics, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So the the energy analysis is uh, uh, what we, what we're doing is is actually an old fashioned way of estimating energy costs. It, it's something that we can do by hand, and it was designed to be convenient to do by hand. And uh, it enables you to quantify the cost of operating your system during both winter and summer. Um, and what we have learned, or what we applied, is the degree day method. And um, it uses a, a, a statistic that has been collected all around the US, all around the world, for many, many decades. And um, that, that's called the number of degree days. There's heating degree days and cooling degree days. And what this means is uh, the, 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 the degree day concept, um, degree days, uh, takes a, a temperature, um, and it's kind of an arbitrary temperature. Um, it's 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, for every day of the year, you calculate the mean temperature for that day, and then you compare it with 65. So let's say, uh, I don't know, yeah, yeah, yesterday was very warm. I don't know if the mean was higher than 60. Well, let's just, let's just take a, 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 let's start with the winter. That's probably easier. So let's take a, a typical winter day in Seattle. Maybe the high is 40, and the low is 30. So the mean is 35 degrees. Okay? So what uh, we would do, and you can actually see this in, in, in the almanac. If you go to the right kind of if you go to the right website, they'll, they'll show up, but they'll, they'll say the uh, degree days. So this is winter, so heating degree days, number of heating degree days would be equal to 65 minus 35, which would be 30. Out, right? The idea being that your, the assumption here is that when it is 65 degrees outdoors, I don't need heat and I don't need cooling. The load, the heating load and the cooling load on my building are zero. In other words, when it's 65 degrees outside, I have no need for energy. Now, we're assuming that this is the case everywhere around the country. And this is where the problem comes in, is that the 65 degree base is, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, but different, it's, it's different at different places, depending on humidity and, and other factors. And, how much lighting there is, and 
how sunny it is outdoors and things like that. So this is kind of very rough. It just says 65 degrees outside. On average, we won't need heat. But as soon as I drop below 65, I'm going to need heating. And I'm going to need heating in an amount proportional to that difference. So 30 degrees, that's quite a lot. I'm 30 degrees below that. So that means I'm probably going to have a high demand for heat that day. I'm going to need a lot of energy. So what you do is, for every location, every city, is uh, every day of the year, you, 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 you track the heating degree days. So maybe the next day, um, this is day one, maybe day two, it's, uh, it's a 20, 20 degree heating degree day. And what you do is, then, then maybe on day three, it's uh, five, five degrees. You know, it's a warmer day. So the mean is 60. And you add these up. So the sum of the heating degree days from n equals 1 to 365, that's the, uh, this number is the heating degree days for the region, for the city. So the higher, the bigger this number, the more demand for energy there's going to be now. The more days are going to be below 65, further below 65. Um, and then there's a similar one for summer, where summer, of course, you're going to be above. So you're looking at the increments above 65 degrees, and that's when you're assumed to need cooling. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it was. Uh, Yesterday was probably 72. How's that? Okay. And the low is, low is, it was pretty cool. It's probably 40, 42, something like that. So the mean. So we probably still need to keep that day. That probably would have, would have classified as a winter day because we're below 65. So the, the number of, of heating degree days would be 8. It seems weird that uh, yesterday would have been a heating day. Um, but there is a, a website. Um, it's a National Weather Service website. And I, I actually have a, a live link to it on my on sheet that goes to, uh, that went to a different part of the page. Let's get okay, back to the, it's the UW weather page. And you get under the great bottom and there's a SeaTac daily climate data latest. So I go to this and it says, okay, yesterday's max was 71. Pretty close. The low was 46. The average was 59. Precipitation, blah, blah, Degree days, heating, six. So that was yesterday in Seattle. So then if I go over to the next column, it says the normal value for the day is seven. So we should have had seven and we had six. So yesterday was pretty close to a normal day. That's amazing, isn't it, that that would be normal? Okay, so then I go over to uh, last year. Last year we had 10 heating degree days. So we were cooler last year. But then there's a, uh, below that there's a, a month to date, month to date, 295. We've had 295 heating degree days in the month of May. The normal would be 188. We've had 295 normally, 188. This is the way, you know, weather geeks or HVAC geeks, this is how we monitor what's going on with the weather. You go to the heating degree, cooling degree stuff. Um, and then uh, the departure from normal is 107, so 107 degrees more for the month of May. Since March 1st, we've had 200, uh, we've had 1,157, 220 degrees above normal. And since July 1st, since July 1st, we've had uh, 
4,634 heating degree days. And that's 430 more than normal. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, abnormally cold year. He, uh, cooling degree days, so far we've had zero. <laughs> There's been no need for air conditioning by this metric. Um, so far this year, that only goes back to January 1. So we're still waiting to have an average day when it's above. OK, so anyway, that's the concept here. Um, and uh, it, there's a lot of assumptions built in here that are, are, are questionable. So this is a rough, a rough approximation that HVAC efficiency is usually not constant. It's more efficient when it's part loaded. And it gets less efficient as you load it you know, really heavy and typically. Um, you've got internal loads that are not being taken into account here. People and whatever's going on inside the building. And uh, yeah, so, yes, yes. I did want to ask in general, you were mentioning about humidity. Uh -huh. Would that mean that a place that would have higher humidity, even if the temperature was the same, would have more uh, cooling days because they might have to run some sort of conditioner just for humidity and not so much temperature? Yeah, it would, it would mean that uh, their, their, their balance point temperature should be something different from 65. It's like you're taking an average for a whole country and uh, you're, you're, you're imposing it on other places. And it may be that other places, 65 degrees outdoors is, uh, and especially if it's a really humid 65, it's, it, could, it would feel something like 70, 70 or something. Exactly. Like yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the degree day method based on the balance point temperature, and that's what we mean, this, this is a balance point temperature, is a temperature where cooling and heating balance each other out so you don't need energy. It's the, it's the point where you're energy neutral in your HVAC system. The outdoor temperature at which the heat load balances the cooling load. And you can imagine, that's gonna vary Every, every building is going to have a different temperature, right? Because you got different things going on in the building. The building's a different design. And uh, nowadays, with the software, the HVAC design software, it actually will calculate a balance point temperature for the building, given its GPS coordinates and its built in the orientation and its windows and things like that. So it's, the software makes this a lot easier. And this is the whole idea is based on a, doing an energy balance. On, on the space, so the change in the energy with respect to time is that that's your, your, your um, heat supplied by the HVAC system, the heating gain from external sources, and then the, the heating that you're losing, the heat leaving the building, being transferred outdoors. And the idea is that it's equal to zero at steady state. So when you solve for QH, and your, your Q loss, your place, your Q loss is equal to the heat transfer. And we use the overall heat transfer coefficient. Then you set this equal to zero. Okay, what, what, what's the, uh, uh, we set the, what's the, the outside temperature going to be when I set my heat load to zero? And you solve that for T out. And T out equals this quantity here, and that's what's called the balance point temperature. And we're saying that this number right here is 65 degrees, is, is a rough approximation of what that number is. But you would really want to calculate it for every building. So this is going to be specific to the building. And this is going to be specific to the outdoor environment and so on. And, uh, and that's, the that's the idea of the balance point temperature. And uh, so you just take the U, UA and replace it with K. It's called the building loss coefficient. And then heating required when T out is less than the balance point and cooling required when T out is greater than the balance point. And then we define the heating degree days as the difference between that average outdoor temperature and the balance point. And we sum those up, that difference up for a period of time, over a day. You can do this over a month, season, or a year. 
as is done in the, the weather reporting uh, almanac data. Um, and that gives us a, a, a degree day for heating. And then similar concept applies for cooling. Day for cooling. And uh, this is a kind of a picture, graphical representation, like temperature versus time. So you can see how the temperature is always going to be up and down over, over the course of the year. The balance point temperature is the, this constant line here. So whenever we're below that, we need heating. And when we go above it, we need cooling. So you sum up, you can do an integration across the total area that's below that line. That's going to be your heating demand energy for heating and then above it would be for cooling. And then historically this has been taken to be 65 degrees um, just to have a standard, a common metric for reporting, comparing numbers across the country and, and, and also tracking the, the number over time at, at the same location. Oh yeah, here's the, um, I actually pulled this down when I made this. So May 15th I made this slide. And um, th this is the data page from the UW weather. So you see the temperature, precipitation, snowfall, and then the degree days here. So that day, the high was 59. The average was 55. So there were 10 heating degree days, which was eight above normal. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it was two, two above normal. Normal is eight. And then it, the cumulative amount over the, for the month since March 1st, so that would be seasonal. And then the cumulative since July 1st. I don't know why they do heating since July 1st, but cooling since January 1st. Oh, so we, we should have had one, one cooling degree day, the day the normal um, so far. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the uh, the assumption in, in this method is that the, the fuel uh, the fuel consumption is proportional to the difference between the mean daily temperature and the balance point, sixty five degrees. Um, and this is the uh, this is how we can calculate. The energy required, this is for winter, for heating, the energy for heating based on the heat loss and the conversion uh, from hours to days, then the degree days. This is a correction factor because they found out over time, as, as buildings have gotten tighter, they find that. The 65 degree balance point overestimates the energy required. And uh, so they multiply, if we use 65 degrees as the balance point, we use 0.77 to, to, to deflate the number a little bit, um, to take into account the fact that modern buildings are more energy efficient, uh, and then divide by the, the difference between the indoor and the outdoor temperature. And typically, this will be these two numbers will be what the engineer designed for. So the design date, energy loss, and the inside and outside temperature difference. There. Yes. So when you mean tighter, you mean there's less less energy loss through yes. the envelope, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you have that number, it's relatively easy to figure out your fuel consumption. You just have to know what the value of the fuel is. That's the quantity or the, the energy delivered per unit quantity of the fuel and the efficiency of, of the heating system. Most gas furnaces are going to be at least 80% efficient. The, the codes now require that they be, I think the minimum is, is, is 80. It was 75. You can get them as high as 95% now if you want to shell out the dollars of a gas furnace 
And really, you know, uh, when you, of course, when you burn fuel, you're generating thermal energy, and that's easy to do. Again, that's consistent. That's going in nature's direction. It's just some of that energy ends up going off into the environment. It goes up the chimney, right? You're burning fuel. And um, it also, a considerable amount of energy uh, escapes with water vapor. When water vapor goes up the chimney with the combustion byproducts, that represents lost energy. So modern water heaters and gas furnaces um, have a, a little mechanism to condense the water vapor out of the, the flue gas. And that recaptures energy, that recaptures that latent energy that otherwise would have been lost in the uh, uh, going up the chimney. Um, so you can get into the 90s now for modern gas furnaces. But I think 75 to 80, you know, older models are going to be in the 70s and more economical, modern ones in the 80s. The heating value of natural gas, that's pretty standard. It varies a little bit by where the gas comes from. Propane. And for electrical resistance, we usually just assume an efficiency of one because we're just uh, converting electricity to gas. And you can also, if you're just interested in the fuel, how much fuel am I going to use this winter, you can make this calculate. You can do that in one step, combining the energy calculation with the fuel. And then if you want the cost, how much is this going to cost, you multiply this quantity by the cost of the fuel. Um, so there's an example here for, uh, for Seattle where we have our design heating load. So this would be the sensible heating requirement for a, a typical winter day. Not a typical winter day, but a, the, the design day is the more extreme, like the 99% design. The outdoor is 30. Um, actually, this, yeah, uh, that's, that's not the extreme because extreme would be lower. Anyway, so the indoor is 72. And uh, then the annual heating degree days in Seattle, 4705 at 65 degrees. And then the heating value of natural gas, we have a 90% efficient furnace. What is the volume of natural gas required for a year of heating and how much will that cost at the current price, which I think now is more like $12 um, going up. And uh, so here's the calculation. It's, you know, it's just plugging the, the numbers into this some nice little convenient formula, 50,000, 24, uh, 4705, and then the 0.77, the efficiency is 0.9, uh, the heating value, and then the difference between the indoor and outdoor temperature and, uh, and that's our approximation of our fuel requirement. And then we can multiply the cost and get $1,080 for our fuel, fuel consumption for the winter. And then similarly for summer, um, the calculation is very much the same, except the units are different because most uh, air conditioning systems are, 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 are run by electricity. Um, so we use the gain for the cooling load, sensible cooling, times 24 hours in a day, and then the cooling degree days. And for efficiency, the measure of efficiency in at least cooling equipment sold in America it, it is the C, or you think it would be the COP, uh, the, the uh, seasonal energy efficiency ratio is related to the CO. They're very similar numbers, actually. Uh, and th this is the thing that just you know you just want to you just want to tear your hair out. But is, this with, with, is this when you go to the store and it says they're in BTU instead of BTU per hour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for the air conditioners, I've seen yeah. that before. Air conditioners rated in BTUs. <laughs> when, of course, it's BTU. For, you know, it's no wonder Americans are ignorant about energy. Because it's an, even for engineers, it's hard to make sense. You've got a uh, Home Depot and you look at stuff and why doesn't BTU air conditioner? What does that mean? But it's really BTU per hour. But an, an ordinary person wouldn't know that. Um, 
just like with the SEER or the EER, um, COP is, of course, it's, it's, the, um, it's the amount of cooling over the, the electrical energy or electric power that you're putting in, right? And th this, this is a very meaningful number to engineers. It's, di it's dimensionless because both are in the same units, right? So this would be uh, a kilowatt over over kilowatts of electricity consumption, or maybe if we're doing, looking at it over time, just the energy part, it would be uh, kilojoules over kilojoules. But it's a dimensionless number. It just represents how, how much cooling do I get per unit of electricity going in. But the, uh, the EER, the energy efficiency ratio, and the S means it's, it's, it's seasonal. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an adjustment. So seasonal energy efficiency ratio uh, is also Q, QL over WE, but they use the American units for these. And in, in America, the unit for heating is BTU per hour. Oh, but then work in is only BTU. And, and then our electrical unit is watts. Oh, oh. So it's not a dimensionless quantity. It's BTU per hour divided by watts, or <coughs> we usually see it as BTU <coughs> over watt hour over here. And a person, an ordinary person, would not know that. And even as an engineer, if you just see EER, the, the units aren't mentioned. You would have to automatically know what these units are, so you, you know if you're going to convert them and, and use them in calculations. So the conversion uh, is uh, what's the conversion is 3.412 um, which, which, which one has a COP right, uh, the, S, the seasonal energy efficiency ratio equals 3.412 yeah, yeah that, that's the conversion and what, what this number is, it's just the conversion from, uh, from kilowatts, uh, from watts. A watt is three, 3.412 BTU. So we have to convert one of these units to the other unit to get it dimensionless. Is that, is that right? It's the other way around. I, you know, I used to just have all this stuff memorized, but now I can't remember anything. I can't even remember my, my suite address. I, I was struggling to remember. You know, it's just a bunch of not one two one zero zero. It's a bunch of numbers in my street address, and I don't often write my street address. It was like, what is my street address? One kilowatt hour is three thousand four hundred twelve BTU. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that that's right. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is watt hour. Yeah, so 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 one watt is 3.412 BTU per hour. I mean, you just want to go nuts, right, with these units. Um, so we should be, uh, I don't know. I try to stay away from S-E-E-R. I used to, my thermo notes, I used to have this in my notes when I taught thermo, and now I just took it out. Th thermo's hard enough without throwing in a bunch of extra stuff, but when you do look for energy equipment in the U.S., you will not see COP. You have to dig into the manufacturer's materials to get that. Um, and I don't know, even the manufacturer's stuff is, uh, Kurt and I were looking through some heat pump stuff and trying to make sense of that. It's all abbreviations and it's hard to know exactly what you're looking at. Um, or can be at times. Yeah. Uh, I was just to ask, like, the word seasonal in there, I mean, it implies that it changes, right? Over. Yeah, I forget exactly how seasonal modifies just the regular EER. 
DR, but it does take into account the, the, the season, the, the, the time of the year when the energy demand is occurring. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly. But in this calculation, we need the SEDR, and that conversion, uh, if, if we only know the COP, we have to use this um, conversion. Okay, so everything, then watts to kilowatts, and everything else is pretty much the same. Um, okay, so this is, this is uh, over a cooling season. Season, as opposed to the whole. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure what that means. How, how that makes it different. So here's another example of Seattle. Um, cooling load, uh, 60,000 BT per hour. When out, it's 85 outside, you want it to be 75 inside. So 10 degree difference. Uh, Seattle annual cooling degree days is 196. Not very much. One of the lowest in the US. Um, and our air conditioning system, uh, SEER, and this will be in the technical, you know, not even the technical stuff, this will usually be pretty uh, prominent in the spec of your equipment, even though people wouldn't really know what it means. They would know that higher is better, right? And actually, the minimum is set by the federal government now. Um, I think in the US, it may be around seven and a half. I, I can't remember now, but there is a minimum. And then there's a minimum to be energy star, which just means you're super energy efficient. Uh, so the cost of electricity, 11 cents. It's a little high for Seattle, actually. But. So we can, uh, again, same process of you know, just collecting the numbers and plugging them in. Um, and there's my seasonal cost of cooling. I've got to go back and compare this to my actual, what my actual cost of cooling is. 296 sounds, that sounds about right, actually. Hmm. Okay, so this is really handy to do, uh, get a quick, quick and dirty, you know, approximation of, you know, how, am I gonna, how much am I going to pay to heat or cool my, my place? All right, so you want to do something more accurate. And this is what you would do actually working in, as an engineer because you would have the software where you could, this would be automated. Is you would use, a, it's called the bin method. And this allows you to take into account the, uh, the, the specific heat loss coefficient for the building um, and you know, variation in efficiency of the equipment as the outdoor conditions change uh, and so on. And in this method, the total energy is the weighted sum of the energy across a frequency distribution of temperatures that occur over a month, season, or year. Do you remember in, uh, we looked at uh, wind turbines? Um, when you, when you uh, before you can size a wind turbine, you have to, uh, you have to map out the frequency distribution of the wind speed at the location. So you have to put test equipment out, and for every hour of a whole year, you measure the wind speed the average wind speed. And you get this frequency distribution, right? There's, at the, the, at the average wind speed, you have a lot of hours, but then on the extremes, there are fewer hours that the wind blows. And that's what this, uh, this is here. Uh, you, you, you typically divide up the, the temperature scale into five degree increments. Let's say 92 to 97 degrees. So I would have a bin. 92 degrees and 97 degrees, and then in the middle is 95 degrees. So I'd have a, you know, I have this bin like that, and then I would have another one out here that was uh, uh, in, at 90 degrees and uh, 85, and I would have these bins that were centered on. Yeah, so, um, so I have the number, number of hours that the temperature was between 85 and 92, so it's, it's the average was 90, I would have the number of hours. So there would be a little 
mark there. And then at uh, 95 degrees, between 92 and 97, it's going to be probably fewer because we're going more extreme. So I would have this, what do you call it, histogram? Is that the histogram where you, you, you plot the quantities of something uh, spread out over a, a range of distribution? So you have something, you know, a small number at uh, you know high temperatures, and then this would go up to somewhere around uh, 50 or 60 degrees. You have a lot of hours, and then we come back down again. And so you would do that for every location, and we have that data. Um, and so here's a. This is from our textbook, and I, I, you know, I didn't even realize. I forgot that we had a chapter in the book on this. I, I should have assigned it. So if, if this is fuzzy, there is a chapter. Uh, this is chapter seven, where they they talk about this. So if you want to see how the textbook does it. But anyway, so you see for Seattle, um, annual bin data. Wow, there isn't any. We have days when it's 90 to 94. I don't know why there's any. So anyway, this is, uh, you see, for different locations. So very few, very small number at the extremes, but then lots in the middle. So you arrange them into bins, with each bin centered on the midpoint. Um, and uh, then we calculate this number, this number here. Um, how much energy is required for heating or cooling for each bin. So instead of the average of the whole year, you calculate the energy requirement for each bin. And you know you can sum those to get the total energy. So you can see this would be a la very labor intensive to do by hand. But in a spreadsheet, it's, uh, it's not very hard to do at all. And actually, this is an exercise you want to do if you're really, if you're working with a heat pump because heat pumps are the, have the most extreme variation with the outside conditions, especially air source heat pumps. And uh, with a heat pump, um, the, uh, well, the COP uh, 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 it is highly dependent on the outdoor temperature. Um, here we see the heat loss in the building. Of course, the heat loss increases as the temperature gets lower. And this is the heat pump the ability of the heat pump to supply heat. So you can see the heat pump gets worse. Uh, its ability to supply heat falls as the temperature rises, it falls. So your, your heat pump is crapping out on you when you're most in need of heat. And, uh, but anyway, where this point meet, where these two lines meet would be the balance point, be the balance temperature for that location with this particular piece of equipment, okay? And we wanted to do, you know, spec a heat pump and do it the exact way we could, uh, we would, you can get the data from the manufacturer that allows you to produce this curve here, and then this curve is based on our, our building, the, the conditions of our building, and then you can calculate the balance point. So anyway, this would be something to do, you know, when we we were uh, going to really go in, into this in detail. And then you take your heat pump and you you match what the heat pump can do to your energy need as it varies with the bin temperature. Here. So there's your bin temperature, and then there are all these uh, properties of the. Uh, what the, what the heat pump is able to do, and you work your way all the way over to total electric energy consumption, and you can see how that energy consumption changes with the bin temperature. So anyway, that, that's, we're not, you don't have to do any of this, of course. We're not doing this method, but that's, if you want to take the next step and see how you could do this with, uh, with software, energy modeling software. This is done in HVAC software. There's also specialized software, energy modeling software that will do this. Um, I imagine that our physical plant people here probably have, in their energy management system, they probably are able to do this kind of, of um, 
calculation and data analysis. Yeah, so anyway, that uh, brings completion to the, the economics part. Yeah. <laughs> And you know we could do controls. I'd love to. Do, did you? Did anybody do the controls problems? Yeah. That's, but don't worry about that. That's yeah. not going to be on the exam. Um, I think I, I made a lot of the students last year unhappy by having that very <laughs> end. And uh, oh my gosh, that was. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So were these equations that were just covered going to be on the exam as well, or is it this? this I think you said the degree. Yeah. Just. Uh, just this. This stuff, the example problems here, like doing it for heating and cooling. Okay. Yeah. And uh, also, if you go, um, I don't know if you saw the, the practice problems. Did anybody see the practice? Yeah, I started it. Yeah, the, the, I put a whole bunch of problems up there. I thought of every kind of problem that I could ask that, that covered what we went over. and. Um, This, this prep here. And um, I posted this on Friday, um, Friday afternoon, I think I posted it. And then I, I, I wrote out all of the solutions. There's a solution, but I did it all, typed it all up. That was my Friday night. It's, but I noticed when I did the solutions that I, some of these answers were a little bit different from the ones I put uh, original and I went back and I changed I, I, I modified the problem sheet so that it, it should now be it should now match the the solutions here but uh, it's a lot of, a lot of work but anyway feel free to just take a stab yes yeah the question is other than the solutions I think you said that you changed Q or uh, Q laws Question seven, and the footnotes. It said the given answer was obtained by using Q coil instead of QS. I guess what's shown is, is that correct? Number seven. Yeah. Uh, number seven was obtained by using Q coil instead of QS. So for Q loss in that equation, is it supposed to be the sensible heat or the um, Yeah, it should be Q the Q the sensible. It should load. be the sensible yes. for, yeah. for Q loss that you plug in. Yes. Okay. It's a sensible. Yeah, and I did use the coil cue instead when I for the for the original answer that was posted, so I went back and changed. Yes. I want to make sure the net altitude of the ray is going to cover the second part. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm I'm trying to make it so that you don't need a psychometric chart. So I'll give you psychometric data, like if you need enthalpy or you know. Hopefully, from the first exam, you know how to use the psychometric chart. I, I know you do because you, you all did pretty. I, I'm going to post your. I'm sorry, I haven't posted the. I haven't posted anything in any of my classes. This <laughs> it's the first time that's ever ever happened. I'm going to try to do that, but it's probably going to be. That's going to be a, a, a project for Memorial Day. Is, is is getting all my stuff into Canvas. But I, I will absolutely it, it, do everything I can to post your first exam results before Wednesday. And have your exams um, return them to you on Wednesday. They, they do still exist. I just have this massive pile of stuff. It's really bad. It's really bad, stuff. really bad this quarter. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can we get solutions for the last two? Solutions for the last two. Oh. Okay, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, the, um, I'll do that. Okay, I'll try to do that. Can I? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. That's true. 
So uh, it will be um, you know pumps and air. So air and water, you know, air and water, moving air and water around. That's a big part. So pumps and fans and ducts and doing the uh, calculating the pressure losses through. You're doing something like that, and I, there almost certainly will be a problem like that on the exam. So I, I, I would absolutely go do this, what is it, problem 12? Um, almost certainly going to be a problem like this. Um, almost certainly going to be a because we've done these, right? And, um, and then these first few problems are just um, are, are, are simple using the ductilator. But if you do these using the graphs in the book, they're going to be more time consuming. You, you, I, you should be able to do these. The graphs, those, those graphs have, uh, let's see, they, they have diameter, velocity, CFM, pressure loss, all of them, you know. It's just a pain to use those graphs. Um, and then, you know, figuring out sizing a fan, um, calculating in that positive suction head or doing a little uh, pumping system like that. Number six just takes this and turns it upside, uh, turns it up or flips that around so that you're, pull, you're drawing it up. You have suction lift instead of uh, suction head. Suction lift means you're sucking fluid up. That's when you have to be careful because you can, you can get into problems with uh, having a negative net positive suction head and ending up with water vapor <laughs> instead of liquid. And that's actually what happens here. You see the net positive suction head negative 13.3 means that you're going to be trying to pump water vapor instead of liquid. And you definitely don't want to do that. Um, this one, you're really good. Having, a, having your source above the, the pump usually protects you from having a, 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 a cavitation issues. Um, I think here we're way up. Of course, you have to compare this with the required suction head, and that's going to be with, on the manufacturer's pump curve at 66.7. That's, that's should, that should keep you well above the requirement. Yeah, and there, you know, there's some economic stuff mixed in here too. So, um, so there, there won't be anything on sustainability then. So I think it, I think it mentioned, I think it mentioned there was a sentence that said just like it said conceptually about sustainability, but not physical. Oh yeah, sustainability. No, no, I, there won't be any. Okay, about that. Um, sustainability. You know, we have one more class meeting after the exam, and, and that's going to be uh, we're going to talk about. The projects, not not a formal presentation, but just you know, share what you learned. We may have our partners here um, with us, and uh, but also I've saved the best for last. We're going to uh, have a visitor from uh, Evergreen Certified. Uh, he runs a, a firm that certifies green buildings. And he's a very dynamic speaker. He's a former student, uh, graduated a long time ago from UW Bothell. And a uh, really good friend of mine, he's going to come in and uh, hopefully uh, get us fired up and excited about the future. So that'll be on the last day. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm done. I have some practice problems you can do. Um, I'll pass them out. Um, if you want to work on them, if you want to leave, that's fine. Um, but this is just extra practice.
Oh, yes. Yeah. Is there an extra one? Uh, yeah, we've got some extra ones here. Do you want to look at the homework? Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. And I'll collect your homework, too, while you're... Um, Solution for this practice? Or just I'm going to give you the answers. Um, and I'm really able to do this. So I'll, I'll do it. Try. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> So you want you want to meet there or somewhere else? Uh, I guess we could just meet here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm meeting it. I mean, I think we also we've done early, so we can. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think you just post your notes. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm 
basically, yeah. yeah. They gave me a plan and like, gave me this and this and this and this. And then I went to the big because of the medical clients to transfer. And then they turned out to the medical clients. And then the medical clients that I did an extra half time for that. So I wouldn't have had to spend an extra year. So we didn't have to spend an extra year. <laughs> I did want to ask on the author for problem number two. Uh, what what uh, uh, what amount per kilowatt hour do you use per kilowatt hour? Yeah. 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 yeah, when it says part C, it says about electricity. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because um, I used, I used 0.07, which was the same one that was just the previous yeah. example, and I got something yeah. different than what you had. That's because, uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't specify it, so you have to assume a number. Okay. I think I used Are you said 10 cents? I think so. Okay. Yeah, that, that, the, yeah, I use ten cents so so Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to get something that's 2,000 still in it. Yeah, 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 I got the same answer as you guys. Thank you. That's a practice problem. Practice problem, you just signed it off? <laughs> no, he was, I was asking him about the... No I, mean, no, I mean the answers there. If you were matching that answer to your answer. Yeah. Oh, I haven't, I haven't done the... Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.